All right, so great pleasure to introduce Karen Strunk for the uh, non-commutative geometry seminar. Positive line bundles over the irreducible quantum flag manifolds. Okay, th so thanks very much for the uh, invitation. I should uh, say that this is joint work with Freddy Diaz Garcia, who's a student in uh, Mexico about to defend his PhD any, any moment now. Uh, Raymond Obochala, who's uh, at the Charles University here in Prague. Andre Krutov, who's with me at the Institute and Petra Somberg, who's also at the Charles University in Prague. And uh, those of you who know me know I'm really more of a Seaster algebraist. And this sort of came out with, uh, came out of uh, too many math conversations in the pub in Warsaw with uh, Raymond and Andre. So that's how I got involved in, in this sort of uh, interesting project. All right, so um, the starting point for the talk is, uh, of course, quantum flag manifolds. And to do that, we need a notion of a quantum group. And the quantum groups uh, that are sort of the nicest, in my opinion, the closest to uh, classical groups are, are the Drinfeld Jimbo quantum groups. Um, so these are very theoretical in nature, as you can see. Um, so we can actually start with a, a finite dimensional complex semi-simple Lie algebra G. And uh, we can always Q to form its universal enveloping algebra. So here I'm asking for Q to be a real number, not equal to one, zero, or minus one. But in fact, uh, Q could be a complex number. I just eventually want to talk about the compact uh, real form. So that's why I'm going to ask for Q to be uh, in R. Okay, so uh, uh, let's call the rank of our the algebra G. <clears throat> and then we want to fix the Cartan subalgebra together with a corresponding uh, root system. And uh, we'll take a choice of simple roots. And we can um, write down our symmetric bilinear form that we get from the killing form of the Lie algebra. And we want to normalize it uh, in such a way so that we can define here our Carta matrix, uh, where the entries are just going to be applying this symmetric bilinear form to, uh, in the first coordinate, we take this co-root, which is defined for you right here. And in the second coordinate, we take uh, just uh, the root that we have in our, our, our choice of simple roots. Whoops. So, um, the quantized enveloping algebra then is uh, generated by these elements here where I is running over uh, one to R. And uh, I don't mean for you to really take in these relations if you're not familiar with them. Uh, the point is that these should look a lot like the relations you see from your usual enveloping algebra. But of course we have these uh, Q deformations in here and this QI is defined for you here. So that depends on our Cartan matrix. And of course, uh, this Ki inverse, uh, you know, it just behaves like an inverse. And um, th the one thing to note is, of course, this doesn't really make sense for Q equal to one, uh, but you can finagle things a bit and uh, you don't actually get back the, uh, you, uh, the enveloping algebra of G, but you get a double cover, I believe. And there are also these quantum stair relations, but um, I don't want to, uh, bombard you with a bunch of relations on a slide. Okay, so these are quite nice objects. And importantly, just like uh, the usual enveloping algebra, these admit a Hopf algebra structure. And we can just define it like this. So we have our co-multiplication here. Uh, this is the, our antipode and of course our co-unit. And the reason I asked for Q to be in R was so that we can define this compact real form um, by putting a, a star algebra structure on our, on our Hopf algebra. Now, this gives us a quantized version of an enveloping algebra, but we would also like to be able to talk about uh, group structures. So Lie groups rather than Lie algebras. And therefore, we want to have a notion of a coordinate uh, algebra for a group. Um, to define this, we need uh, some representations. 
So here, curly P is the weight lattice and P plus just means the dominant integral weights. And whenever we have a dominant integral weight, we can find a representation. So we find an irreducible finite dimensional left UQ of G module, that shouldn't be curly, sorry about that, um, which is uniquely defined by this highest weight vector. The highest weight vector is just something that satisfies this condition here. So this is, this is our, our action of uh, UQG on, on, on the vector. And this turns out to be unique up to scalar multiple. And any finite direct sum of such modules is called the type one representation. And more generally, you can talk about weight vectors. And this is just a vector in your representation uh, with weight, uh, weight v, v, which satisfies this nice uh, relation here with respect to the action of this uh, diagonal subalgebra, I suppose. Um, OK, so from this, we can define uh, the coordinate ring of, of such a module. So we look at uh, elements in the C linear dual, which can, can then be given a, a right UQ module structure. So since it's the dual of something with the left module structure, we get the right module structure. And uh, given a vector in our module and uh, one in the dual, we define these maps from UQG into the complex numbers where we just map X to uh, that, that particular function evaluated at uh, the vector that we get when we act by x on v. And the coordinate ring of v is just then these, uh, the span of all these, these functionals here. And this is, of course, in the dual of uq of g. Uh, but in fact, it's even in the uh, Hopf dual of uq of g. And from this, we can define the quantum coordinate algebra of G, where G is the associated compact connected, simply connected, simply group, which has uh, track G as its complexified Lie algebra. And uh, this is a Hopf subalgebra of the uh, Hopf dual of UQ of G, just given by the direct sum of these coordinate rings, where we're summing over all these dominant integral weights. Did we, I mean, did we? We lost the uh, speaker. <laughs> yeah, just wait. Just wait, she will come back. Yeah, I think. Ah, oh, yeah, it is, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. My internet decided to uh, crash on me there. <laughs> so let me just share my screen again. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> So um, from my perspective, I crashed just when I was telling you about how you can think of OQ of G as uh, polynomials on, on G. Was that around when I froze or was it sometime before that? Uh, there we go. Yeah. So I hope, I hope this is more or less where I lost everyone. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I was, I was just saying that if you're not so familiar with the Lie theory, uh, you can think of this as polynomials on G, but now G is quantized. So it's going to be non-commutative. Um, and uh, if you're, again, familiar with uh, sort of compact quantum groups, a la Voronovich, uh, then you, this will always be a dense sub hopf algebra in a compact quantum group. So it's like the algebraic version of, of what you might be used to in the Seastra algebra world. Okay, um, so we have a quantum coordinate algebra of, of a group, which we think of as a quantum group, but we really wanna talk about 
quantum flight manifolds, so we need to talk about homogeneous spaces. So for that, uh, we do something completely analogous to the classical situation. We look at the Levy subalgebra. Uh, so the Levy subalgebra is given uh, here. This this subalgebra generated by the ki ej fj, where you take all of the ki's, uh, but you restrict uh, the ejs and fjs to some subset of simple roots. And since we have a dual pairing between uh, uq of g and uh, the coordinate algebra oq of g, we get a le left action of, of uq of the Levy subalgebra on oq of g. And then we can talk about the quantum flag manifold. This is given by the space of invariant elements uh, under this action. So I haven't really told you what the action is, but. Uh, well, I guess actually it's given right here. So yeah, it's not, it's not super difficult. Um, you could also, if you're not so comfortable with enveloping algebras, define this in such a way that avoids that by looking at the coordinate algebra of OQLS and uh, you can have, you'll have a surjective map onto OQLS and you can use this to define a right co-action and then you just look at the space of uh, co-invariant elements and it should give you the same thing. Um, so when uh, our set, set S is actually just all the roots uh, save one, which has a uh, coefficient one in uh, the uh, expansion of the highest root of G, then we call this quantum flag manifold an irreducible quantum flag manifold. So what exactly does that mean? Here is a diagrammatic interpretation. Um, so these are the Dinkin diagrams for uh, the various uh, Lie groups, Lie algebras. Um, and these uh, nodes that are in black correspond to choosing this uh, root that will give us the uh, irreducible flag manifold. Uh, and I should just point out that for this guy, we could just as easily take uh, black out this root instead of this one. And for E6 here, we could also take this root instead of this guy. So this is uh, all of the flag, irreducible flag manifolds. Um, and they are very nice. Oops. So here is why flag manifolds are great. They have an extremely rich geometric structure. So for example, uh, not only are they manifolds, but they're complex manifolds. And moreover, they're even Kähler manifolds. So in, in addition, they're symplectic. And in fact, they can be equivalently described as the compact homogeneous Kähler manifolds corresponding to a uh, compact connected simple Lie group. Uh, and when they're irreducible, they're even symmetric manifolds. So these are essentially the best kind of manifolds you could possibly ask for. If you woke up on Christmas morning and unboxed an irreducible flag manifold, you would be the envy of all your friends. Um, we have a borel vey theorem for the line bundles over flag manifolds, and this is a starting point for geometric representation theory. Uh, the study of their cohomology is a whole branch of mathematics called supercalculus, which has fundamental connections to combinatorics and integrable systems. And uh, here in the Czech Republic, uh, we have uh, numerous parabolic geometry, uh, people who study parabolic geometry, not just in Prague, but also in Brno. And parabolic geometry is essentially a way of uh, doing differential geometry uh, using flag manifold sense. All right, so flag manifolds are great. We want to know if quantum flag manifolds are equally great. So do they admit uh, some form of non-commutative geometry, which is analogous to their classical counterparts? So we saw that the way they're defined is so has so much in common with uh, their classical counterparts. We have a lot of sort of Lie theoretic machinery lurking in the background. So these things seem like excellent candidates to uh, look at uh, from the perspective of non-commutative geometry. Okay, so uh, to look at non-commutative 
geometry, we're going to need some geometric structures to put on these things. Um, and for this, we're going to talk about a differential structure coming from a differential calculus. So I guess this was first uh, introduced by Voronovich with respect to the compact quantum group SU2, quantum SU2. Uh, and of course, it's been since studied by various other people. So what do I mean by differential calculus? Well, we're going to be only really concerned with ones over star algebras. So we want a differential calculus over an algebra B will be a differential graded algebra uh, that is uh, generated in degree zero. So by that, I mean, it's generated by elements A and DB where A and B are in this degree zero. And uh, what does this have to do with the algebra B? Well, we want this zero part to be isomorphic to B. Uh, since we have a star structure on our star algebra B, uh, we would like this to extend to a differential star calculus. And uh, that will be one in which uh, the star map works nicely with, uh, so, so our, our star from B works nicely with our, our, our uh, algebra here. So uh, it commutes uh, with D. And when we take the star of uh, a form wedge another form, then we just flip them move the star inside and multiply by uh, minus one to the K times L where K is the uh, degree of omega and the L is the deg degree of mu. Um, and then we can extend this uh, to arbitrary forms in here. Um, so I should just say that uh, in, in a differential calculus, what we normally do is uh, in anal uh, analog with the, the classical situation, we, we use this wedge project product to symbolize multiplication unless the form is degree zero and then we just juxtapose with uh, another form. So the total degree of a differential calculus is the least integer m such that uh, omega k is zero for every k greater than m. And uh, if in addition, our B happens to have a left A cohomodule algebra structure for a Hopf algebra, Hopf star algebra A, then which, which will be the case, of course, for our quantum flag manifolds, then we can talk about uh, left A covariance of, of the calculus. And this just means that our left coaction of A on B extends to a left coaction on uh, omega bullet making omega bullet also into a left A co-module. So um, we're eventually aiming at uh, Kähler manifolds. So for that, we first need a notion of a complex structure. Uh, these were introduced by uh, Edwin Beggs and Paul Smith, as well as uh, Kalkali, uh, Landy, and, and Soilicom, and I think perhaps all of these people minus Paul Smith might even be uh, in the audience today. Uh, so we have an almost complex structure for a differential star calculus that just is going to be uh, n squared grading of our uh, calculus. Uh, and it should satisfy these two things here. Uh, this is sort of obvious that we want this. And then for the star, we just want it to interchange uh, components around the uh, horizontal. So uh, we call this a complex structure if in addition we have this property here. So D omega A B uh, gets moved into omega A plus one B A and A B plus one. And again, if we have uh, B as a left A module algebra, then we can talk about uh, covariant uh, structure on this. And that just means that these, this decomposition is also a decomposition in the category of left A co-modules. So uh, complex structures have nice uh, ramifications. In particular, we get a, a double complex. So by defining these projections, uh, so here is uh, a plus b plus one, and we just want to project onto in, in, in the n squared grading uh, on either side. Then we can define uh, del and del bar here 
by composing uh, D with these projections. And if Omega bullet has a complex structure, then we get some very nice uh, interplay between these guys uh, that you see here. Uh, in particular, we get a double complex, which we call the Dobo, Do, Dobo double complex. And these, of course, will satisfy uh, a graded Leibniz rule. Okay, this is a bit uh, maybe hard to take in. So here is a picture of what's going on in uh, the case of quantum projective planes. So of course, this is a perfectly nice uh, example of a irreducible quantum flag manifold. <clears throat> and it will have such a structure. Uh, so here is our, our usual uh, DROM complex. And now here is its uh, decomposition into the n square grading. And because the differential here splits up in such a way, we get, uh, we get this picture over here. And so, for example, if we're applying D to a form that's in here, either the form is going to be in 1, 0 or 0, 1. So let's say it's in 1, 0. You apply D, you get a form in here, which then decomposes uh, into these parts. Uh, but since we have this decomposition here, a form here that moves up has a zero, no component over here. It just splits into these two components. So it's a very nice, uh, nice structure. We would now like to put on even more structure because uh, we know that our flags should have these uh, nice, nice structures. So we can talk about Kähler structure. So we take our complex structure and if it has a total degree 2n, so it's even, and there is a closed real form kappa in uh, the 1, 1 uh, component. So closed uh, just means that d kappa is zero and real here means that if we take the star, we just get back kappa. This gives us uh, these isomorphisms uh, where L here is this left chef operator, which we just get by composing uh, or by multiplying a uh, form with this Kähler form. Uh, then we say that this is a Kähler structure. So this pair is Kähler structure. And this gives us a canonical Hogstar map uh, in analogy with the classical case. And uh, from this, we can define a Kähler metric, which we say is positive definite. If the metric is positive definite in sort of a Hilbert pre-C star module, pre-Hilbert C star module way. Uh, so we're asking that uh, this form lands in B star B, which we sort of think of as positive elements. Uh, in our star algebra B, even though that doesn't quite make sense since we're not in uh, C star algebra. But of course, if we were to complete, these would be exactly positive elements. Um, we could also just get rid of this closed part and then we would have a uh, Hermit Hermitian structure. Um, but we won't have any examples of those. So uh, let's just consider Kähler. All right. So here again is our quantum projective plane and our uh, double complex here. Uh, these maps L give us isomorphisms along uh, the uh, horizontal line here. So applying L here, these two modules are gonna be isomorphic. These are isomorphic and applying squared, we move up twice and again, we get isomorphisms. So this gives you a very nice way of calculating what is, what is actually in this complex, for example. So to paraphrase Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, uh, what does Kähler geometry give us for a quantum Kähler structure in this case? Well, a long list of quantum miracles. So uh, this definition of a Kähler structure uh, implies many nice properties that are completely analogous to what we see in the classical case. 
So for example, just looking at cohomological implications of this structure, we get things like a Hodge decomposition of the Durham complex. We get Lefschetz identities and therefore the hard Lefschetz theorem. Uh, our Kähler identities implies that the Dobo cohomology refines the Durham cohomology. We get Serre duality. We get a Codera vanishing theorem for positive line bundles. And this will actually uh, come into play a little bit later. Um, as well as many other things, and I suppose many other things to be discovered, uh, what the implications of such a structure are. Uh, so, sorry, Karen, can I ask a question? Of course. Yes, uh, in, in relation to hard Lefschetz, uh, you see, as you know, I mean, classically, it relates to representation theory of SL2C. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is cohomology actually is a module for SL2C. Essentially, that's, uh, that's what it's saying. Is it now in, in the quantum case, is it related to SL2C or SLQ2C? <laughs> you, both. you know what I'm asking? Both, as a matter of fact, both. The big pardon? Is it, it, uh, for, it relates to both, actually, both the quantum SL2 and, oh, uh, okay. Okay. and yeah. classical SL2. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's very nice. Okay. So, uh, with all these, uh, there's a misspelling of Dolbo. You're right. There sure is. Is that true? Wait. What did I write? Uh, Oh, you're right. I'm missing an L. Thank you. Thank you. This should be uh, Dolbo. Hopefully, I didn't do that repeatedly, but uh, yes, thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Uh, so, with all these uh, tools in our in our in our toolbox, uh, let's let's see what we can say about uh, line bundles on quantum flag manifolds. Okay, so um, obviously we've had the quantum flag manifolds in mind, or in particular the irreducible quantum flag manifolds. Um, and I, I've already shown you uh, that quantum projective plane has one of these uh, Kähler structures. So uh, why is that? How do we see that? Well, uh, we have this remarkable theorem due to uh, Heckenberger and Kolb in these two papers here um, that says that over any irreducible quantum flag manifold, there exists a unique finite dimensional left OQG covariant differential star calculus. Uh, so this it means this here just means that it's a left OQG co-module OQGLS module, um, which has classical dimension, uh, which is to say that, uh, so the dimension is given to you here, I don't really want to get into what this phi map is. It's sort of uh, a map that in our non-commutative case is like looking going from a global picture to a local picture. So this is somehow giving us something like the dimension of, of a fiber. Um, where M here is, is the complex dimension of the cor corresponding classical flag manifold. So if you recall, uh, our Dinkin diagrams that we had, uh, these were exactly the irreducible quantum flag manifolds. And here you can see uh, what their dimensions are. Um, so this is very nice. It looks a lot like the classical case, which is what we were hoping for uh, so that we can uh, try to see if these admit Kähler structures. Okay, so uh, Marco Matassa showed that the Huckenberger Kolb calculus of an irreducible quantum flag manifold indeed admits a unique covariant uh, Kähler structure. So consequently, we get all of these lovely properties uh, that we saw before. So Hodge decomposition, hard Lefschetz theorem, Serre duality, Dobo, which I obviously spelled wrong again. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Codera vanishing uh, and um, various other properties, many presumably yet to be discovered. And uh, in particular, these cohomology groups have at least classical dimension. So there's no uh, obvious dimension drop uh, that's happening for the cohomology groups in this setting, which is which is really nice. 
and suggest that this is a um, good, good uh, definition. All right, so uh, the title was about positive line bundles on uh, the irreducible quantum flag manifolds. So we need to know what a line bundle means in this non-commutative setting. Uh, so of course, this is all inspired by the Sarah Swan correspondence. So when we have a star algebra B, we think of a vector bundle as just being a finitely generated projective B module. And in this case, we'll think of them, we want we're going to be working with left modules, but of course you could do this with right B modules. Um, and of course, uh, the key point is that if B happens to be commutative and we're looking at uh, functions on a space, then this gives us uh, a, a module of sections of vector bundle. Now there's no more space, so we can't consider sections, but we can still consider modules. So that's what we do. Um, how do we talk about line bundles? Well, again, in analogy with what happens in the commutative setting, we're just going to look for bimodules, which are invertible. So uh, that just means that we can find some B module E check, uh, such that we take when we take this B balanced tensor product of the modules, we get back uh, B and we can do this uh, in either direction. Um, so we call this we call this a line bundle over B, and we would like these, of course, to interact with our uh, differential structure. So we would like a notion of a connection. So if we have a B and it's now equipped with a differential calculus, then a connection for a left B module F is going to be a C linear map nabla from uh, the vector bundle to omega one tensor F. Uh, satisfying uh, this, this here for every B in B and F in F. And if in addition, we have a complex structure. So remember that that means that this is actually given, can be given in an N squared grading. Uh, then we can talk about a zero one connection. And that is gonna be just a connection with respect to uh, the differential calculus given by omega zero bullet and del bar. So recall that this will give us a, a, another complex. So this, this makes sense. Now, if we have a connection, we can extend this uh, from F uh, to omega bullet tensor F uh, uniquely by defining uh, the nabla. So by abusive notation, we're just gonna call it nabla again, omega F tensor F. Uh, is going to be d omega tensor f and then minus one to uh, the degree of omega uh, wedged with nabla f. So this is, of course, just for a homogeneous form uh, with a particular degree, but from this you can uh, you can extend it to everything. And then we talk about the curvature of a connection, which is the left v module map nabla squared. Uh, which we now know how to do because we have extended nabla. And uh, this is said to be flat if, if squaring nabla gives you zero. So a holomorphic vector bundle will then be a pair F and then del bar F, where F is a finitely generated projective left B module, or of course a vector bundle in our, in our uh, lingo, as well as a flat zero one connection. And we will refer to this connection as the holomorphic structure for this pair. Since uh, this is a flat zero one connection, uh, this, uh, this pair here, so taking omega a bullet for any a, uh, tensoring it with our vector bundle, this will be a complex. And then if we stick in B uh, in the second component, we can talk about the beef cohomology of this complex and it will be denoted like this. A vector bundle is Hermitian if B is a star algebra and uh, F is a finitely generated projective left module. And now we have uh, just, again, in complete analogy with what happens in the classical setting, we're going to have a 
non-degenerate sesquilinear pairing, <coughs> excuse me, satisfying these three properties. And again, if you're like me and you're more familiar with uh, some C-star algebras, then you can see that this is essentially just saying that what we have here is a pre-Hilbert, pre-C-star module. So we want uh, that we can take out elements of B on the left. If we flip F and G inside our form, then we take the star in, in B. And uh, we want this to be uh, positive definite, again, in the sense that if we think about elements B star B as positive elements in our star algebra, then whenever we have a non-zero F in our, in our vector bundle, uh, and we take the uh, form uh, with itself, then we get something that's a non-zero positive element. So to equip these with some sort of holomorphic structure, um, ah, okay, so I, I have written here Hermitian structure, but this should, we should actually consider just Kähler because I didn't really introduce this. Uh, Hermitian, Kähler, Kähler is Hermitian, so there's no need to worry too much here. Um, so, I mean, I guess before I was calling this Kappa, anywho. Um, if we have a Hermitian structure, then we can talk about uh, holomorphic vector bundles. So in particular, note that this, so this is our, our, our Kähler metric from before. This will be a Hermitian vector bundle. I, I erased the wrong thing. All right, so let me just, it's here that this should be Kähler, not Hermitian. This is, this is still Hermitian. Okay, um, right. So this does actually give us a Hermitian vector bundle. Um, and in that case, we can define a, a sesquilinear map from any Hermitian vector bundle. We tensor it with uh, omega bullet and uh, we define it like this. And again, this might look a little bit ad hoc, but if you're familiar with things like Hilbert, uh, modules, then this is just taking the tensor product of the, uh, this is the, the natural tensor product uh, uh, metric that comes out, or inner product rather. Okay, so uh, we can also define this uh, math frac f, which again, which now goes from omega tensor bf into omega tensor bf rather than b. And we say that the connection is Hermitian if uh, when we take the differential of this uh, HF FG, we get this over here. And then the holomorphic Hermitian vector bundle is just a triple uh, where uh, F and HF is Hermitian. Oh, sorry. And uh, F and del bar F is holomorphic. So we have this nice result from Edwin Beggs and Sean Majid that says for any Hermitian holomorphic vector bundle, there exists a unique Hermitian connection, NABLA, uh, that satisfies del bar is the projection tensor identity uh, composed with NABLA. And we call this the churn connection. And this allows us, this is what have, the existence of this churn connection is what allows us to uh, define what it means for a bundle to be positive or negative. So this was uh, first defined in this paper on the archive, the Codera vanishing theorem for non commutative Kähler structures. So I've already mentioned the Codera vanishing theorem that we get. Um, so if we have a Kähler structure and a Hermitian holomorphic vector bundle, we say that it's positive and just write f greater than zero if there is some positive uh, real number theta such that the churn connection satisfies uh, this, this uh, here. So minus theta i, this is just complex number i, kappa tensor f. And uh, it, completely analogously, we can say that f is negative if, if now we have theta 
we don't take minus theta, we take theta itself. Okay, so what do uh, vector bundles or line bundles rather over our quantum flag manifolds look like? So um, here we have our irreducible flag manifold. Recall that this was created using the quantum enveloping algebra of uh, the Levy subgroup, subalgebra. Uh, we can also define another subalgebra of UQ of G. This looks a lot like the Levy subalgebra, but uh, we don't have all of the KIs in there anymore. So we throw out all the Ks, KIs that are not uh, in our set S. And uh, in a completely uh, analogous construction, we look at the fixed points of the action of UQLSS on OQG. And this gives us OQG, which I've written as LSS. And uh, this will admit a free U1 action. And the fixed point subalgebra of this U1 action will be our irreducible quantum flag manifold. So we think of this uh, as the total space of a principal circle bundle over OQGLS, uh, just as we would see in uh, the classical setting. Um, so this, of course, gives us an induced Z grading. And this decomposition here all the EKs will be OQLS covariant line bundles uh, over our irreducible quantum flag manifold. And uh, with a little bit of work, um, again, using some of the lead theory that's lurking around, we can show that this is in fact all of the OQLS covariant line bundles over OQ. Sorry, this should say OQG. Covariant line bundles. Um, all of them will arise in this way. I fear I've made that typo elsewhere. Okay, um, so um, these are probably well known to a lot of people in the audience if we think about the special case of quantum CPN. So here, uh, our, our circle bundle is just the odd dimensional quantum sphere. And if, if we actually look at CP1, then we're just going to get the quantum hop vibration over the podlet sphere. So um, for every covariant line bundle uh, EK over uh, our irreducible quantum flag manifold, there is actually a unique covariant zero one connection and it's flat and hence this gives us a holomorphic structure. So we think of these as holomorphic line bundles. Um, so now that we know that these have a unique covariant Hermitian structure and they're holomorphic, they have a turn connection by the result of Majid and Beggs. And so we can ask about their positivity. So uh, just a, an example here, uh, these really do give us something that's cutiformed. So a lot of this looks so, so close to the classical situation that you wonder if we're actually just uh, painting some old uh, barn or something. And uh, there's nothing really new here. Uh, but indeed, if we look at uh, quantum CPN, then you can see that uh, the numerical invariants involved here are Q-deformed. So these are, are Q integers, and uh, they're very different from, uh, so this is, this is very far from being K, okay? Um, so it's not so important really what it is. The, the take home message here is that this is actually something different. And it's different in somehow a very canonical way because we're just swapping in these Q integers for integers. Okay, so um, again, from this non-commutative Codera non vanishing, uh, we can apply this to uh, describe exactly when we have positivity or negativity. Um, so essentially the main piece, I'm sort of running slow, low on time, so I, this is um, the up, upshot here. If, if this uh, cohomology is non-zero and this one is zero, then we know our covariant line bundle is positive. And if we swap our del and del bar, uh, then we have a negative line bundle. So in general, of course, 
it could be quite difficult to determine what these groups are. But again, um, because the irreducible quantum flag manifolds are just so nice, we actually have a way of at least determining when they're going to be non-zero. Um, so this is the borel weil theorem for the non-commutative uh, setting of irreducible quantum flag manifolds. And this sort of builds on the results of many people. So Beggs, Majid, and again, Kalkali, Landy, and Van Solikom, and Landy, Motodello, I think I, I spelled that wrong here, and um, also Karasnuto, Marzinski, Obokola, Diaz, Garcia, Obokola, uh, et cetera, um, which allows us to calculate this degree zero cohomology. Uh, so I've written down uh, the statement here. I, of course, haven't really told you what these are. Um, the important thing is just that they will, in fact, be non-zero uh, when k uh, is greater than zero. So, so this e k e minus k, this, this is exactly what's coming from our circle bundle. All right, so um, it follows that for any irreducible quantum flag manifold, if k is greater than zero, then so is the line bundle. And if k is negative, then our line bundle is also negative. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, we can actually say a lot of nice things using, using this framework. And there's actually quite a lot more in the paper than just this. But of course, time is of essence. So I would just like to, since this is a non-commutative geometry uh, seminar, point out that there are really nice analytic applications as well. Um, so whenever we have a covariant Kähler structure over a back quantum homogeneous space, I haven't quite defined this, but you can just ignore it and put it in quantum flag manifold if you like, because that will these will be um, compact quantum homogeneous spaces. Uh, the idea is uh, essentially that we want to be able to complete things into C star algebras at some point. Um, so this associated Dolbo Dirac operator. Uh, so del bar plus uh, the co-differential here twisted by a line bundle will always be diagonalizable. Um, so when we have a negative line bundle, uh, there's a non-commutative version of the Akazuki Nakano identity. Uh, and this can be used to show that the spectrum has a strictly positive lower bound. And from this, you can actually conclude that the operators are Fredholm. And of course, this is an important ingredient into trying to construct spectral triples on these things. So it would be uh, really nice uh, if we could somehow relate all of this wonderful non-commutative geometric structure we have here with uh, the ideas of Khan vis-a-vis uh, -vis spectral triples. Um, so uh, the difficulty, of course, is always this compact uh, uh, the resolvent condition. But um, I think this looks this looks quite promising. And probably Ray, who is in the audience, has actually done this for certain examples and actually shown their spectral triples. Um, but maybe he can he's here somewhere. Oh, CPN, he tells me. Okay, so for CPN, uh, we can actually write down spectral triples. Um, okay, uh, so that is the end of my talk. So thank you for listening. And I would also like to just say happy birthday to Miriam Mirzakani and happy International Women in Mathematics Day. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Karen, also for these last slides to point our attention. So other questions? Yes, I, I have one question. Uh, you see, what happened classically was something like this. I mean, there, there was this theorem of Rotendieck Birkhoff that they, I mean, it classifies holomorphic vector bundles on spheres. I mean, yeah. I, I mean on CP1, not the spheres, that's much harder. And then, uh, then, the, then there was a theorem of Atia, which classifies holomorphic vector bundles on elliptic curves, I mean, on complex tori. So in, in non-commutative geometry now, we, we, are, uh, we are in a funny situation. Uh, these things for, uh, I mean, elliptic curves like non-commutative tori has been done, it's, it's classified. But then, uh, as I mean, as Johnny and Walter remember, our starting point was to do this Grothendieck theorem uh, for CP1. 
And amazingly, uh, this is still not done. So <laughs> despite all this work, I, I, I think one should really look into this, uh, I mean, very carefully and see what is going on. I mean, uh, that's uh, this has yeah, to do with, with representation theory of, uh, I mean, SL2C. Uh, I don't know if it's SLQ2C will be relevant or not. Another thing was, uh, I mean, because classically, again, uh, on CP1, you have only a unique holomorphic structure. There, there's a uniqueness. And this is a still, we don't know. I mean, if uh, on, on CPQ1, for example, there is a unique holomorphic. So this is, this is like, a, these are like interesting problems. I mean, still, I think for CP1, CP1Q is still, there are a lot of things we don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, somehow uh, CP, CPN is, is somehow even, even better behaved than just your bog standard irreducible flag manifold. So, it's yeah. certainly trying to understand that would be a really nice thing yeah. to, uh, to yeah. do. Yeah. This would be very nice to also. I mean, well, thank you for your nice talk. It was very nice. Yeah. Thank you. So, maybe in line with this, I have a question, which is. Um, which is about, uh, so this is about the ring structure that Masood was uh, kind of referring to, and you also mentioned probably, is that, that um, so you have holomorphic uh, structure defined as a flat connection, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what happened? So I remember that there was an issue if you take a tensor product of two flat connections, is it is not necessarily flat again, except if you're in a one-dimensional case. So uh. how does that, how does that work? I mean, is that clear how to proceed? I mean, do you have a tensor product that kind of respects this? Um, because that's the ring structure on this zeroth cohomology. Yeah, um, that that is a difficult question, actually. So I I, I don't know that that we have a way around that at the moment. Um, sort of, yeah, work in progress. That's, uh, yeah, good tough thing. issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, this is quite a difficult question. I mean, this is something that we come across when constructing sheets and so on. It's, it's work in progress, definitely work in progress. Okay, thanks. You're muted, Karen. Sorry, I have Ray in the same room as me. I hope you were able to hear him. We don't want to get yeah. feedback by putting on our things at the same time. So yeah, yeah. I have Alessandro Caratinuto is here as well, actually. Oh, right, right. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> got a bit of a gang, uh, so we can work afterwards. Excellent. More questions? All right, so thanks again for a great talk. Yes, thanks again. And I'm sorry about my uh, internet uh, breaking down there in the middle. So thanks for being patient with me. Alexa. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, thanks. Karen. We see each other next week. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Karen.